Hey there again. I'm coming back for another episode of uh, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. I want to talk today about how does cancer begin? And I'm going to start off with talking about kind of the established understanding of how cancer begins, the very conventional approach to looking at this problem. I think it's definitely um, the way that most medical professionals are trained. I don't know if necessarily most medical professionals believe it. I would say most probably do, uh, although there are a select few probably that have abandoned this view, but it's definitely the way we are trained um, conventionally. And I would say probably the majority of the public also believes this because the way we were taught kind of gets pushed onto the public and we kind of parrot this view onto patients, um, et cetera. So I'm going to start off with looking at a slide from the NIH um, the, and the National Cancer Institute. And I'm going to highlight a couple of things. I don't want to just read off slides, but I want to, I want to, so basically cancer is a genetic disease, very definitive, uh, the way they say cancer is a genetic disease that is caused by changes in genes that control the way our cells function especially how they grow and divide. Okay, I think this is pretty well known everywhere. However, what I wanna highlight in this uh, is that they kind of talk about genetic changes because of three major things. The errors that occur as cells divide, okay? Then there are DNA damage by harmful substances in the environment, such as chemicals and tobacco smoke and ultraviolet rays from the sun. And I just wanted to highlight that because they're talking about carcinogens and they're giving two examples here, one of tobacco smoke, which we know causes cancer, a variety of cancers, as a matter of fact, but they place, I think, interestingly enough, ultraviolet rays as the other example. And as we talked about in several videos, but most recently, there is definitely a clear risk versus benefit of UV or ultraviolet rays, in particular, looking at sunlight and knowing that sunlight probably does not cause melanoma and there's excess deaths of all forms of mortality from not enough UV rays and that almost all cancers are reduced by UV exposure, including melanoma, it would really be you know, hard to believe that that UV rays are a major cause of cancer, although UV, you know, in excess can cause DNA damage. That that is that is true. But I just think it's interesting that that's the two examples they give: smoking, which is a known carcinogen, and UV, which very likely um, lowers the risk of all forms of mortality, including cancer. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And then they talk about inherited genes, uh, genetic disorders, right? So I want to go to the next thing, which is something that a lot of us in medical training learn about. And this is the two-hit theory. Now, what is a theory? A theory is basically someone's hypothesis or guess of how something happens. And this remains a theory, right? And so this is not definitive, this is not proven, and it's up for debate. Yet, if you go back to this, cancer is a genetic disease, okay? Very definitive. So what they talk about in the two-hit hypothesis is that you basically have normal cells with normal genes, and then you get hit, AKA a gene mutation, in one of the chromosomes, and then you get a second hit on the opposite end of the chromosome causing cancer. And then in the hereditary side, you have basically a hit at birth, and then you get another hit throughout a somatic mut mutation uh, or a mutation that happened after birth, and you end up with cancer. So this is the two hit hypothesis of how cancer starts as a genetic disease. However, there are some issues with this theory. And if you know anything about how we 
treat cancer um, as a as a genetic disease because that, that is how cancer is treated by Western medicine. You're going to see some problems with this, especially in the new era of personalized treatment and or targeted therapies, because they are targeting certain genes that are thought to be in certain cancers. So what they're finding, however, is that when they actually study and they sequence the genes of different tumors, and this, uh, and again, this is from the NIH slash National Cancer Institute. Uh, over a two-year period, the investigators tested 10,945 different tumors from 10,336 patients with 62 different types of advanced or metastatic cancer who had typically gone undergone several rounds of cancer treatment. And overall, they found 78,066 mutations, 22,989 alterations in gene copy number, and 1,875 DNA rearrangements. The majority of these alterations had not been previously identified. They estimated that 81% of the alterations would have been missed by other sequencing tests and that only read frequently mutated areas of the genes known as hotspots. So let's just stop for a minute. We're going to be doing personalized treatment. We're going to be targeting specific genes that are damaged to known to cause cancer. Yet now we have at least 78,000 targets to go for. Moreover, in another study from 2002, they estimated that the number of gene mutations in a single cancer, that they had more than 10,000 different gene mutations. What's even more enlightening is that there's evidence that some benign or non-neoplastic conditions or tumors that harbor several mutations that have no cancer. So that kind of throws a little bit of a wrench in that. So basically, how if there's more than 10,000 genetic mutations in a single tumor, how can we realistically have targeted therapy? So in this paper from 2017, named DNA mutations may not be the cause of cancer, what they're saying is that furthermore, mutations of the DNA do occur and for a multitude of reasons, but without necessarily causing cancer, the same mutations that would see, be seen in cancer. So new directions will draw themselves when more focus is given on the event responsible for the switch from a cancer, a normal cell to a, to a cancer cell, it kind of toots their own horn by saying that until then, targeted therapy will can certainly continue to improve patient outcomes. However, it is unlikely to eradicate breast cancer, in this case, breast cancer, depicted here. And then I pulled a little other snippet from later on in the paper. This is just the abstract on the left. These observations clearly show that the drivers are many and diverse. And the main question here is how do you conquer cancer with that many mutations in a single cancer type? How many drivers can we target at once in a given patient without increasing toxicity? It's a great question. In this other paper from 2020, what they looked at were known, basically cancer driving mutations. And they're showing that there are benign conditions or pseudo benign conditions such as you know sunspots, melanotic, melanocytic nevi, ductal carcinoma in situ, non-invasive grade one, low grade bladder cancers, and then these non thought to be non-cancerous myeloperiphery disorders. And only a very small percentage of these will actually be cancer. So for the BRAF mutation in particular, only 40 to 50% of this you know driver mutation results in actual cancer. The rest of these are non-cancerous conditions. HER2, for example, is only responsible for 11 to 20 percent of invasive breast cancers. The rest of these are ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, for this is bladder cancer, and then this is acute myeloid, which is the worst possible you know situation with a leukemia, acute leukemia. Only two to five percent will have the JAK2. Uh, so I think this shows that, number one, that cancer may not only be a genetic disease, number one. Number two, that the targets that we've been looking at as the causals may just be happenstance because we're seeing all these benign conditions that have the same mutations without being cancerous. And it throws a wrench in our ability to actually treat cancer because these there may be 10,000 gene mutations in a single tumor type, which leads to too many targets without causing toxicity in patients and with ever the ability to actually eradicate the disease. I'm going to talk about something that even those further wrenches in this plan in terms of treatment. Next, when we talk about cancer 
stem cells. Okay. And we'll talk about it in the next episode, cancer stem cells. We'll talk about this at length and how this makes it even more difficult for uh, not only for the, the truly genetic theory of cancer, but it also throws a wrench in the conventional treatment that we do for cancer and makes it virtually impossible to eradicate 100% of all the cancer cells. So until next time.